What's up, guys, and welcome to the Score Esports Podcast. I am your host, as per usual, Colin McNeil. In the booth with me, we got Josh Burry. I always forget that you're going to cut to me first. <laughs> and I always do. It's I not know. like I throw yeah, you it's, off. This, that's a scheduled thing. And it's then like, who do I always cut to next? Daniel Rosen. Hi. Hello. I'm there. number three. That's how it works. I was there for that one. I was there for that one for sure. I'm so. the youngest person in the room, so I go last. Your shirt looks like you're bleeding into our, our lovely new DX Racer Oh, yeah. No, I, right this is now. actually custom DX Racer camouflage. Wow. Yeah. I, what I, I possible want to, use I love the DX Racer so much know. that I want to be one with it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's just how much I love this really comfortable chair that I'm sitting on. That's really nifty. You know what I love? What do you love, Colin? League of Legends wow. layoffs. Hey, you didn't even let me finish. You oh, thought I was going to stop at League of Legends. Okay. Um, as you guys know, we're in the thick of it when it comes to uh, NA playoffs, and we've got just the man to talk about what's going on in North America in terms of LCS. We've got Chris Hopper on the show today, also known as Chopper. He is the head of esports North America for Riot Games. And Josh, I guess without further ado, let's just cut to it. Let's just bring him on. Hello, Chris. How's it going, guys? Good. How are you? We're good. Doing well, doing well. Excited. It's uh, we got a big weekend coming up. Yeah, no kidding, man. No kidding. I, I'd expect to see uh, a lot more squiggles on that white board behind you, actually. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we we try to hide where the casters are planning out the various scripts for the weekend. So that's in a different conference room. That, yeah, that, make, makes, that makes total sense. That makes total that one's sense. Like, that one has to be like deep underground somewhere, right? Like you keep it locked down to make sure no one can stumble in on it. <laughs> yeah, no one, no one can know what our script writers have in store. <laughs> Some wackiness, I hope. Yeah, I think probably probably a little bit of that. I think it's already pretty. You look at the two teams in this final. There's already a fair bit of wackiness, honestly. I don't know yeah. what you're trying to say by that. Uh, well, I mean, no one would have predicted. Well, a lot of people are predicting Liquid, but uh, yeah, Team Liquid looked good. Um, but before we get into uh, the nitty gritty of that kind of stuff, uh, Chris, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about. Uh, some other issues regarding the the final that's coming up in Miami this weekend. So sure. in the past, you've had NA finals in some really big uh, venues. Uh, I had the pleasure of being in the finals when you were in Toronto at the Air Canada Center, mm -hmm. which is where the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs play, favorite hockey team, all that good <laughs> stuff. Awesome venue. Pro pro what is that? Like, it's like 17.5 thousand or something. Um, but this time, you're in a bit of a more intimate space in Miami. Uh, from what yes. I've seen, it's kind of like almost like a concert venue. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, why that is? Why the why the sort of breaking the trend of going to ever bigger stadiums? Sure. Um, you know, when we when we look at events, we always want to kind of keep the event experience fresh for our viewers. And you know, we've kind of been going to these big basketball type arenas for the last couple of years. And to an extent, that show kind of always plays out in a similar fashion. It's the same entry shot. It's the same stage. You know, it's the same kind of players walking in out of the tunnel kind of experience. And we wanted to see if we could mix that up a little bit. And part of doing that was looking at, at potentially smaller venues that offer us a very different look and feel. Um, the Fillmore, in this case in Miami, is kind of similar to the look and feel of the Chicago Theater that we had back during uh, Worlds 2016. And we really loved some of the cool shots that we could get there with having you know, a balcony and just kind of the, the, the decorated nature of the theater. The, you know, the film arts can be an art deco venue, so just a lot of really great kind of um, spirit and flavor to the venue itself. Um, and also we've, we figured that by looking at potentially smaller venues, it actually expands our geographic pool of where we can potentially go. Um, when you look at the spring finals, it is historically uh, slightly under demand for tickets as opposed to summer finals. And so we want to make sure that while we're still doing the big uh, kind of arena shows every year, we thought by kind of pushing those more towards our summer finals, which have a greater demand for tickets, it gives us a little bit more flexibility to kind of do something different in spring. And so this year we decided to try that out with a smaller venue um, and kind of push it down to Miami. Uh, which might not have kind of the, you know, the established player base of a New York or a Boston or a Toronto, but it does allow us to go into that market with a high confidence that we'll be able to sell through the, the event itself. Um, and in this case, you know, obviously we saw that there was even greater passion for tickets as uh, kind of some unfortunate delays with Ticketmaster demonstrated. Mm. Um, but overall, you know, we're, we're excited to kind of see how this new format looks and feels for the fans. Uh, not only in the venue, but also on broadcast. And we think that if this works, it's going to allow us to hit a much more diverse set of geographies going forward. Fair enough. Do, do you feel like um, 
there might be anything lost in downsizing the crowd. Like I understand you, you're getting more intimate, more interesting shots, but I know for me, like I say, when I do get to attend live esports events, which really isn't that often, it's so incredible to be in a stadium full of esports fans. It's, it's just so um, not unlikely, but it, do, it doesn't happen often. It's not like sports, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll share a brief personal anecdote. You know, when I was first applying to Riot back in 2012, I wasn't, I hadn't been to an eSport event before I had, I had applied for the team. And I actually ended up going to the, the championship finals at the Galen Center as I was considering whether or not to join the team. Um, and that experience reminded me so distinctly of going to college basketball games at Cameron Indoor Stadium at, at Duke, where I, I did my undergrad that that connection drew me in the connection with that large audience with that passionate crowd with kind of the fervor building in the arena i, I mean that's an unmistakable an unmistakably positive experience so we're surely losing something by going to a different venue our hope is that we can gain something different that is similarly positive here because the problem with being one of seventeen thousand people in a venue is you feel completely isolated from the show you're part of the crowd, but you're not part of the show. Our hope here is that by having players and our, our fans be so close as the backdrop to the casters, be so close to the stage, you know, so many of them, uh, such a higher percentage of them are going to get to meet the players through fan interaction that we actually end up with the players going to this show feeling a much more tangible part of the experience itself. And so while it, it certainly won't be the kind of, you know, nostalgic, uh, you know, we were all in this together moment that, 17,000 people at Air Canada Center or Massive Square Garden would be. We think that this can provide a, an incredibly positive experience for those there and shouldn't diminish the experience for those watching online. Chris, that's actually something I want to ask about uh, because I actually had the chance a while, I guess it was about a year ago now, to go to a really intimate esports event and it was actually a, a Hearthstone tournament. And mm -hmm. the reason it was so small was it was in the Bahamas. So it, there were a lot of people making the trip necessarily. <laughs> And, Small player base. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> the player base is pretty big, but I think like uh, you know there were like 200 seats maybe in this venue. And yeah. It was, and again, it was in the Bahamas, so you had to be in the Bahamas, which is like a whole other travel thing, right? right. It, you mentioned the fan experience, and I really want to ask this. One of the cool things about that event was I could literally walk up to the best Hearthstone players in the world and ask them a question. What sort of like interaction is really happening at this event? Because you mentioned that there will be a greater chance to meet the players, but I'm sort of wondering like these are obviously busy guys that got busy mm -hmm. schedules. So what does it really look like for the average fan attending this event in terms of uh, potential interaction with the players? So what we normally try to do is we normally try to take the players who aren't playing that day and make them available for fan interaction. So the guys who are playing on Sunday, we try to bring them out on Saturday to be able to meet with the crowd, take pictures, um, you know, have have their favorite, have their fans be able to say hi to them and kind of get introduced. Um, and so we, we've historically done that at events before. Um, we're, we're, we're potentially, we're trying to double down on that in this instance and really make sure that, that, you know, everyone who wants to be able to interact with those players is able to, not only kind of in the venue itself, whether that be kind of before or after the match, uh, but we're also looking at kind of using this, this really cool space um, outside of the venue, this kind of really cool lawn space outside of the venue um, to create a cool experience for ticket holders to be able to meet some of the teams out there. Uh, not only the teams participating, but potentially if they're, if they're attending players and owners from teams who aren't participating in Miami. So we're trying to make it sort of uh, an even more cohesive sort of overall league experience. And for those interested in participating, um, you know, they will have a lot of fans out there who are excited to meet them. Um, and then we'll kind of have our standard uh, fan interactions on top of that. It'll just be a lot more accessible given kind of the smaller audience. Okay, that, that's pretty interesting. I, I think there is a future for these kinds of events. And so I, don't, I wasn't as taken aback, I guess, when you guys announced it. I know, I know a lot of fans were, were maybe shocked or maybe a little disappointed by it. But uh, having experienced a smaller scale event, I think it has its own charm. And uh, I'm excited to see how, how I guess that works out. The pitch sounds cool uh, with Chris talking about it, to be honest with you, right? Um, but I, I still have to say I, I love the idea of esports and big venues. I don't think we've exhausted yeah. that yet. And oh. I know that's not what, what Chopper is saying as well, well. Well, the one thing that I think we kind of that, – that we're, is in our minds as we discuss this topic yeah. is for so long, 
when you're explaining esports to somebody, <laughs> yeah. it's like, yeah, we sell out stadiums. Yeah. Like that's yep. a, that's a point of pride in this community, right? True, truly. We truly. sell out stadiums. We sold out the Staples Center. Well, I didn't personally, but you like <laughs> esports did, right? So so I think maybe and, and we saw Travis Gaffer make a video about it that like it is a point of pride. It, it is this sort of like yeah. we can do that. I, I do think it's worth noting, though, that while it is a point of pride, and that's certainly been a, a means of establishing the legitimacy of esports uh, kind of here to date, I almost look at our willingness to go to Miami, knowing that it's a smaller arena, knowing that we're going to kind of take some lumps from fans, knowing that we're potentially going to take some lumps from media. And and I almost look at that as a degree of confidence that, that we know we're here for the long, the long haul. If this was something where we were scaling back because we were concerned about the future, I don't think this is necessarily the place where we would scale back because it is so visible. This is something that we're doing as a conscious decision because we think it could lead towards better high value opportunities for, for fans who might otherwise never be able to access a live esport event. And, and so for me, the fact that we're going down this road should be in some ways, as, as ironic as it might sound, indicative of our commitment to esports because we're not afraid to, to go to that smaller venue. We don't necessarily need to continue to trade off on the media buzz of, oh, they sold out MSG, oh, they sold out Staples. We'll have that during summer finals. We'll have that during Worlds. Mm. You know, we believe that we can use spring to kind of experiment a little bit and try and deliver some alternative value uh, kind of events. That makes sense. I like I like that approach, actually, using, like, specifically picking spring and, and not just doing everything the same for every um, event. I did want to uh, talk a little bit about the climate of NA uh, currently. This is the first split where the franchising model has been in place. We spent all of last year here at the Score Esports talking about franchising. I feel we did so many of these yeah. very, very shows on it. Um, <laughs> and um, I think I listened to them all. Ooh, oh, wow, big good. fan, that's great. Good, good. Appreciate it. Yeah, shout outs to uh, all the teams, which is almost all of them who, uh, who were able to share. <laughs> just missing one. Just, just one, uh, just one. <clears throat> uh, anyways. <laughs> So this is the first split where we've had franchising in full force. And from an outside perspective, it certainly seems like it's it's been a success. It is so cool to see 100 Thieves in the finals. Hell but yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Josh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, we love Nate Shot here, so uh, that's part of it, too. But um, we, we love him here, too. <laughs> oh, I, I bet you do. I bet you do. Now, we know how stringent uh, the criteria and the process was way back uh, a year ago, less a little bit less than a year ago. When it, when it came to the application process, because we know certain teams didn't make it that were possibly surprises to some people. And I guess the question at the end of this giant rant is, did the new teams in the L in NALCS, have they uh, so far uh, fulfilled and made good on their pitches and their promise to get a franchise spot? Uh, yes, I would say that we're we do not regret any of the individual uh, franchise decisions that we made. Uh, if, if we went back, I think with knowledge of how this split went, I think we would, we would pick the same 10 again. Um, you know, certain teams might have experienced more success on the rift than others, um, but that's not the sole means by which we're evaluating the partners we brought in. We're evaluating them across the staff that they're trying to build, the, the organization that they're trying to build, the way that they're gonna be working with their team, the facilities that they're providing, the means of interacting with their fans. And so, you know, while you can look at 100 Thieves and Clutch and say, obviously the two paradigms of a new franchise team kind of experiencing that immediate success, you know, I look at Optic and I can see a lot of things I can point to as being really positive indications that they're taking this seriously, that they're investing in this for the long term, um, and that they are, you know, and, and that they've been really great partners with us behind the scenes uh, in facilitating a lot of communication between the owners and collaboration on a variety of kind of league initiatives. So I think there are certain orgs that, that might be more visibly uh, kind of strong, strong out of the gate uh, for the, the newer franchise orgs. But, you know, from my standpoint, I'm, I'm still very happy with everyone that we selected. Mm -hmm. Fair. Have, have those new teams, like you said, right there, you, you don't, I, I, and I don't mean to put this in that you regret the decision. Cause like you said, you want, you would stick with these 10 teams no matter what happened, but have they been, I guess, as effective or, or more effective partners in the NALCS than the, than the teams that they replaced? Yes. I, I like mean, that. I, I think, 
Yes, I mean, I, I think when it comes down to it, um, one of the things that I've enjoyed most about this first split has has been something unfortunately rather invisible to both media and community. Um, and that's been the openness that the team owners have had in working with Riot across a variety of topics and initiatives that were previously kind of considered sacred cows, either on the team side or on the Riot side. Um, you know, we've had uh, some initial owners meetings. We've actually separated into multiple committees, handling everything from revenue opportunities to branding to uh, league finances to competition and team operations and strategic planning. And we're talking through topics on how to improve the league this year to how do we kind of secure the league for 2025. You know, we're trying to hit a variety of topics and really leverage the depth of experience and talent that a lot of these organizations have. And in that case, I think that's where a lot of the new franchise teams really stand out, uh, not only in their in their their background and their talent that they have that's that's coming on board, but also just in their willingness to help. I mean, these guys understand that they're kind of newer into the ecosystem. In some cases, this is their very first foray into League of Legends, and, and they may not know the space as well. And so they're making up for that in effort. And, and that, to me, is a really positive indication of where these guys are going to go down the road. Because you know, they'll be able to sign great players and they will be able to sign teams that are able of competing on the rift. You know, judging them after one split's performance is is way too unfair and way too small of a sample size. So from a competitive standpoint, I'm not concerned about any of these guys building a roster that will compete in the long term. My question was coming in, are they going to be great partners right off the bat? And that's where I can unequivocally say that all 10 partners have been really great to work. Yeah, I don't think anybody should be trying to judge the competitive standings of one split, especially because the whole point of franchising was that you're able to kind of make decisions for long-term planning and not worry about relegation. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's almost kind of, and I, I apologize, I just cut you off, <laughs> yeah, Sam, but okay. like, I'm just thinking of like, you know, I'm just going to say it. I'm thinking of Golden Guardians, oh. right? They didn't have a good split. There were some changes that came about that were not planned. Um, and, and I think it's actually going to be awesome to see them go into the summer split. I'm actually going to be watching them pretty closely because you yeah. you just hit the nail on the head, Dan. It's just like now they're in an environment. They're not sweating bullets. Oh, we will do anything to get out of relegation. They can actually make meaningful long, long-term long changes. It would be so cool to see that. Absolutely. But, but what I'm curious about is you mentioned there sort of the, the sacred cows that, uh, you know, either Riot or teams didn't really want to discuss or didn't want to give up. Can you, you talk about the committees, but can you talk a little bit about what those things are that are now, you know, as it were, like they're they're on the board to to be discussed and be negotiated about. Sure, um, I think one of the main things has been around essentially sort of sponsor activations and sponsor relations with with both teams and Riot and kind of the ways that we can make that collaboratively better. Um, I think you know before you kind of had sponsors who interacted with Riot and they worked with us on inventory that we controlled, and then you had sponsors that interacted with teams and they interacted with teams on inventory that the teams controlled. But what it turned out was that there was a lot of kind of middle ground inventory that both Riot and the team sort of shared. And we both sort of stayed away from because we didn't necessarily want to step on each other's toes. Mm -hmm. I think with having a lot of, with having all these partners in house now, we're able to think through questions like how can we effectively sell against, you know, a set of inventory that perhaps overlaps what might have previously been considered to be sort of in the control of one realm or the other uh, to the betterment of the entire league. And so whether that's, you know, rethinking how jerseys uh, should be kind of constrained with different logos, whether that's thinking through a league-wide jersey deal and kind of, you know, trying to standardize apparel uh, and bring in an apparel sponsor, whether that's thinking through how sponsors interact with teams in the production of their in-house content, like, you know, Squad or the Heist or things like that. You know, there's a lot of ways that we're, because all of the kind of incentives are aligned and because everyone's on board with with creating this for the long term, we're able to kind of really go back and look at some of the policies that might be at this point a couple years old and, and really try to reevaluate them in the sense of, is this where we want to be going forward? Does this make sense in a system where everybody's partnered now and there's not necessarily the potential adversarial relationships that could have existed before? Um, and really just kind of like, does this policy still make sense in, in, in you know 2018? So uh, we're, we're going back and we're looking at a lot of those. I'd say, you know, there's relatively fewer uh, retroactive changes that we'll make in the sense of like, there's, I would say there's fewer policies that we need to go back and really adjust. There's a lot more opportunities that we think we can take on collaboratively. Uh, and we're going to, you know, hopefully have some more information on that kind of the coming weeks and months as 
uh, you know, teams and Riot continue to meet and continue to work through some of those items. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chris, you know, it's really when I when I'm hearing you talk about this collaboration, what really strikes me is how different the the end result of this collaboration must be now from even just a year ago. Like what we're talking about are organizations that previously had many reasons to be somewhat adversarial. Like they're mm -hmm. they they all want a piece of it. They have to get go out and get their own piece. Obviously they need to make sure Riot is satisfied with whatever they're doing. Like you said, they don't want to step on any toes. But really you guys are now in this position where these teams are in business with Riot, but they're also partners in the same thing. Uh, yep. Obviously they have to compete for players still, but like in terms of signing and whatnot, mm. but it's just, it's crazy to me to hear you talk about that in, in such a, like a cooperative sense, because truly these people are, are no longer, you know, competitors in the business sense. They are indeed partners. Yeah. You know, I, it's, it's, I would say it's a lot credit to the owners for, uh, you know, having such a sort of mindset shift, I would say between the end of, 2016 when we were sort of facing the LCS forever movement to the end of 2017 when everyone was sort of able to kind of see what we were trying to do with the franchise model and then commit to that uh, obviously in such a, a grand fashion um, but to an extent that's also what we built the model for you know when we looked at the economics of how teams were existing in, in 2016 they were all going for the same sponsorships with the same sponsors and they were bidding against each other and one would say I'll take it for 50K. So the next one would say, I'll take it for 40. And eventually it's getting sold for 20. And there's just such missing value there. Like there was just so much opportunity being wasted because teams were were fighting with each other instead of collaborating with each other to say, how can we get the best deal for all of us together? And so that's why I think the revenue sharing component for the league was, was really a big deal. Um, and I think, you know, it would have been easy for us when we first started doing the revenue sharing component to just say, okay, guys, Riot's going to share out a piece of their revenue, you know, what we make on the broadcast and what we make on sponsors. Um, and everyone's going to kind of be able to chip in on policy changes and that kind of stuff. And like, we're going to be partners because we're all going to be kind of eating from the same pie. The problem with that would have been, it still leaves the teams at odds with each other because they're still trying to maximize their individual return versus the collective. By getting the teams to invest their own funds into the, the league revenue pool and by getting them to share their proceeds in, it now greatly reduces the barrier of competition and it actually creates a lot of alignment where teams want to work together because they realize that they're probably able to capture uh, additional value from exclusivity uh, with sponsorships, whether you know across members of the team or team plus league. Um, and so it's really been a, a, a very refreshing sort of change of heart from sort of the we're all in this for ourselves uh, kind of LCS forever mentality to you know, really kind of doing some deep thinking, honestly, for a lot of these teams over the course of 2017 and, and coming to the realization that not only was this something that they were willing to put up, you know, 10 or $13 million for, but in a lot of ways it, it forced them to change their their outlook on sponsorship and competition and, and how they would work with other teams. Um, and I, I would say that's, that's a credit to a lot of them. And that's in no small part, one of the major factors of why we picked the teams that we did. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit of the, you know, teaching to the test, I would say, and how those guys came about. But it's also credit to them for making that that decision on their own. I'm, I'm really curious about the revenue sharing because it's something that was sort of, I think, aside from the permanent part, you know, semi-permanent partnership stuff, it was like the big thing about franchising, right, was that people, the, the teams wanted revenue sharing. And I, I, what I'm curious about is outside of the, the team supported stuff, we've seen a couple of sponsorships come in, but the LCS wasn't necessarily a like, profit oriented operation beforehand I, as far as right. like anyone could tell and what has kind of had to change to make revenue sharing kind of work in this structure um i i think part of it is a mentality shift on on our side um and, and part of that to be frank is one of the reasons that i was excited about moving into this position as, as head of na esports was it came with something of a mandate to drive some of the revenue opportunities of the bd success of north america um, and so to that point, we're building out a greater BD staff. Uh, we've been working with an agency that's uh, led to both uh, some of the deals that we have in place now, as well as kind of a lot of things that we're you know, hoping to announce in the coming months. Um, and so it really did require kind of a change in mentality. I think 
when we started esports, we knew it was going to be a, a, a cost center for Riot. We, there was no ifs and buts about it. And it continued to be that for the for you know the entirety of the time we've been doing esports. It's never been a revenue positive stream for Riot. But because we knew the value that it was driving for players and because we knew the end state that we were trying to get to, it was still a justified investment on the part of, of Riot senior management. Now we're getting to the point that with teams invested, and so now their economics are kind of shared with ours. There's so many parties that are at this point motivated to get to that financially sustainable state that it's now worth a greater degree of our attention and our investment from a time perspective um, and our resources to kind of develop some of those monetizable elements that, that we might not have developed as much before while we were working on getting you know a world class content team out there or you know developing a, a, a great studio or you know, trying to plan out worlds um, or, or something like that. So I would say that the monetizable element has become a much greater priority. Um, and I think, you know, that's as th th that is both, you know, kind of the more mainstream elements like sponsors and, and media distribution, as well as some really kind of bold uh, long term bets around, you know, like uh, fan programs and kind of doing a lot of cool merch with the teams and, uh, you know, some of the some of the stuff that we've we've thrown onto a marker board in some of these meetings with the owners has been uh, really exciting and and a lot of development work certainly to come. But uh, we're we're extremely positive about where the future is going to go on that front, and we think that it's uh, it it'll, it'll be a good amount of work. But we believe that it's it's certainly within the reason to get all parties in North America, including Riot and the teams, uh, to a very sustainable point for esports. You mentioned a bit about sort of like the, the kind of partners. And before I kind of jump back on that, I, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the MLB Advanced Media deal that was uh, talked about uh, last year uh, when it was publicized. And I think at the time we sort of heard that the changes would kind of come into it. Nothing would change until this summer. And I, I guess I want to ask kind of what is the current status with that and what are the plan changes for now? So right now there, there aren't any explicit changes that are going to be going in for summer. Um the, the deal that you're talking about um, it essentially contemplates both sort of a distribution element uh, and a platform element, and they sort of go hand in hand um, of, of having an ability to distribute content on a platform. Um, and that, that ability, frankly, isn't, um, it isn't kind of at the point where it's monetizable. So until both of those elements can kind of go live, um, there's, there's no changes kind of going in place. It's still something that we're, we're working on and we continue to work on. Um, and so until that changes, you know, it's kind of the same, you know, uh, you know, Twitch and YouTube, it'll be the same experience. And even when, you know, something like that changes, if a new player uh, comes into play, you know, we're not looking to force people off of Twitch and force people off of YouTube. We want to make sure that fans are always able to go and enjoy the content wherever they happen, wherever they want to enjoy it. And if that's dependent on a certain feature set, uh, or you know where their friends go to watch. We want to be cognizant of that. So we're we're never interested in sort of driving people off platforms uh, solely for financial gain. We want to make sure that it's always built around the user experience. And so you know until there's something that's uh, convincingly better, um, de regardless of who develops it, you know there's no change that we would want to make to drive players away. That's a very. Um, I, I had a different question in mind when the camera cut to me, but <laughs> what you just said now got my brain going a little bit here uh we know that there's been lots going on with esl's recent move to facebook uh, out, uh this is completely outside of league of legends of course it's dota mm -hmm. 2 and uh, csgo mostly and there's been uh some growing pains in that regard and a lot of we've discussed this on this podcast and also in the office a fair bit and a, a lot of the sentiment i think is like well yes it's a business move yes that's not a problem you know that's a normal thing everyone can just calm down nobody likes facebook at this point okay but if it helps this tournament organizer if it helps esports it's a good thing but but what you're saying is you're you're not you're you're looking if i'm correct at more of a long game you're not necessarily interested in saying well this this bid this contract for you know insert uh, media company here is really good so you know what see you later twitch yeah i i, I mean I can't imagine us ever trying to make a decision that would be that blatantly uh, sort of that blatant of a trade of player value for money. Um, you know, we've always been motivated by delivering the best player experience that we could for our fans, whether that be across League of Legends or across the esport itself. Um, and so while there might be an eventual point where we do seek, 
you know, better opportunities to monetize across the platforms. I would say that we wouldn't do those unless they were at a minimum value neutral to the players. And in a lot of ways, we would we would be seeking opportunities that are additionally value positive to players. So, you know, going exclusive with the platform only if they're able to develop a feature set that is so widely better than anything that exists mm -hmm. that players would naturally want to migrate there anyway. So, you know, we're not we're not interested in um, you know kind of playing games uh, for for monetization if it's going to cost us the uh, you know the the fandom and the goodwill of our audience. Like that's mm -hmm. that's who we built this esport for, and it's not worth you know short term economic gain if we're losing uh, you know the passion of our fans. Fair enough, fair enough. This is why, like esports guys, everybody does things differently, different models, different leagues, different monetization <laughs> options, and you get to see which one works. And we just get to stand back and and watch it all go down. <laughs> now, the original the original question I was going to ask you is still on the franchising topic. Is that we recently learned that EU is going to be franchising, yeah. and I guess you're you're only a split in right now. It is early, early days. However, I was wondering. Is there anything that you might do differently or any hiccups along the way that you might take, go to the EU offices, give them a call and say, guys, you need to do this one a little differently? Um, I, you know, I, it's funny. We, we did so in a more literal fashion than that. One of the main uh, individuals who worked on franchising on our side um, actually uh, leads our international team right now and is spending a good portion of his time working with the EU team. Uh, to build out the the franchising process over there, kind of leveraging a lot of the insights that he had uh, through the process here. I think one thing that we underestimated was um, the the kind of duration that some of the legal documents would take, uh, both in sort of creation and in revision. Um, you know, I think we always anticipated that it was going to be a complicated process, and obviously the league structure of this format is incredibly dense and incredibly complicated. Um, and as someone who had you know, helped to write and revise the the old LCS team agreements over the last several years. I certainly had a, a degree of uh, kind of compassion for that. But even still, I, I think, especially when you're talking about the kind of partners that we're bringing into the league, um, some of whom might be new to esports, there's just a longer kind of familiarization effort that goes there. So our, our advice to EU was start as early as possible hmm. um, and, you know, just be as communicative as possible to those in the process. Um, and it'll it'll help uh, kind of solve a lot of the the difficulties you might hit as you get closer to kind of the the finish line because the more you're in, you're kind of keeping teams and, and potential applicants abreast of the changes that you're making and why you're sort of making them and uh, you know the spirit of what you want the league to be the easier it will be to kind of then agree on the terms of what that is. Um, I think EU has a great head start in that. Uh, they're they're leveraging very heavily the North American model, um, and so a lot of what they're doing, they're able to kind of point back to the North American league and be like, it's working over here. See, this is what we're trying to do as well. Um, and so you know there will certainly be some uh, interesting kind of differentiations between the two systems, but I think by and large they should get a pretty good leg up on sort of seeing our process out in the wild and you know owners being able to talk to NA owners on on you know why they bought in and. And uh, hopefully those owners will be strong advocates of the system, as I expect they would. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I think EU should be in a pretty good shape with their their system. They have certainly less trailblazing to do than we did. One thing I did want to ask, Chris, and this is partially because I think, uh, you know, you go back a little bit back into 2017. There were some, some pretty serious concerns that EU owners had brought up with the future of the league. Obviously, there were some plans that were reported later reported to have been canceled, et cetera. How, how similar do you feel from your position the situation is for EU when it comes to franchising? Because certainly we've seen, uh, you know, there, it is a different economic situation yep. in Europe. Uh, there's maybe fewer owners that are willing to take the same leaps potentially. Some people have said, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but like, do, is, are there things that need to be like substantively different about EU and uh, how similar is their situation to NA, do you think, pre-franchising? Yeah, I, I would say the differences in the EU are primarily going to be tactics, not strategy, if that makes sense. I think when you think about the change in mindset that both Riot and the teams have to make coming into a franchise system, it's primarily around collaboration, right? It's around working with each other to develop better monetizable opportunities, better content for our fans, better working conditions for our players, 
uh, you know, and, and just overall value for the ecosystem. And so the more that everyone's invested in that collaborative mindset, the better off it's going to be. And so that that's a change that NA had to make. That's a change that EU will have to make as well. And I think it will feel fairly similar in that regard. Now, the difference that EU will have is that some of those specific elements, some of those tactical elements of how they go about creating that additional value will be different. You know, as an example, with the sort of multinational nature of Europe, it's probably going to be a lot easier for teams to sort of try to almost like corner national markets, you know, whether you have, uh, you know, one team as sort of a Spanish team, one team as a German team, not necessarily in, in terms of geolocation, but potentially just in sort of affiliation, you know, that's where their owners from, or that's where their players are from, or that's just sort of where they choose to make their headquarters, where they practice in the off season. You know, I could see a world where they actually are able to leverage that multinational kind of economic nature to a great benefit. Whereas obviously in North America, we have, the US and Canada to play with, so there's not as many sort of markets to corner. Um, so I think when you think about elements like that, that's where the changes in EU will have to come. You know, there's obviously gonna be a ton of legal intricacy around how employees are treated and, you know, player unionization and associations, that kind of stuff in Europe. And, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of differences along that regard that I think are, are kind of gonna be obvious in retrospect when we look at how there's just differences between German law and, and US law. Um, but I think in terms of the larger sort of goals of franchising, they should feel fairly similar. And, and I don't necessarily look at Europe and see anything that's been precluding them from from franchising. You know, throughout kind of the the process last year, a lot of a lot of those who were working on NA were kind of simultaneously thinking like, could this fit into EU? Um, and so you know, through a lot of conversations with the EU team, uh, you know, when they were exploring some different models for what long term sustainability could look like as we started to really kind of crystallize what NA was going to look like, it became more and more apparent that that system could also work in EU. Um, and so I think, you know, there won't be necessarily as many changes as you might have to imagine. Um, and the, those that I think will happen will, will probably be at a more tactical team-based level. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't mind me asking, this is something of a, almost like a housekeeping question, but it's something that I'm trying to kind of piece together from interviews I've, I've had with a couple people. Uh, sure. I'm just trying to figure out essentially what the kind of structure within eu is right now and, it, and it's simply just who is who is placed where and who is what um i've heard from sources that uh john needham uh was at one point heading up eu is, is and and was based in uh north america is that still the case uh i'm not sure where he's based but john needham is the the director of essentially all publishing and operations in eu mm -hmm. and so esports would fall under that as one of the components he's responsible for okay and I know that recently um, Alexei Kranov, I think, who was uh, formerly with Riot Russia, moved to the EU esports team as well. Is is I can't recall his position. Though. He's head of esports. So I think that's sort of like your is that your role across the pond, as it were. I don't know that. <laughs> our <laughs> Alexa, uh, well, Alexa, our Amazon again. Alexa device uh, <laughs> wants to answer for you, Chris. I apologize for yeah. that. Um, no, yeah, a Alex is is moving over into a similar position to mine in EU. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you. So, I, I, yeah, I just just trying to clarify. Just it's yep. it's tough sometimes to keep track of it. You know, if you're not in the offices, as it were. Yeah, no, for sure. I, yeah, I just, John, I think took a, a much more sort of public uh, relationship point with the owners when he first started, mm -hmm. uh, because we didn't yet have uh, you know someone like Alex ready to transition into the role. Mm -hmm. So I think he sort of you know was able to take a more active role up front, and and you know uh, obviously we'll probably continue based on the relationships he's built, but. Uh, you know, bringing in Alex is a great sort of foundational element for that team. I just realized that you said, I think you said Alexa, and then Alexa was like, that, that's hey, what did that, uh, Oh, that is 100% what, what happened. Yeah, no, I unplugged her. She's She's gone Can now. we uh, <laughs> Can we have her as, like, the permanent sidekick, like the comic relief for the show, like, just here? Just, I'm sorry, no, I don't she's know just going to laugh creepily at us as we do our podcast. So, that's uh, true. That's true. <laughs> The um, I wanted to jump a little bit back to uh, our talk about NA franchising, and I sure. want to talk about the the future of kind of the of the league and, and of how franchising has gone so far. And this is a stuff that's a little bit far off, but there well, has you know fans have talked about it, and I think a couple of, of teams have kind of brought it up here and there. Do given that like we've seen China expand really rapidly in light of their their franchising move, do you see expansion as like in the future for NA? Is it something that Riot is kind of actively talking about at all? Um, yes, I don't think necessarily in 2019. Um, and it's definitely something that we're talking about. It's something we're actually talking about with owners fairly regularly. Um, you know, there's a lot of tricky factors towards expansion. I think 
One of them is the, the depth of the competitive player pool um, and making sure that essentially by expanding, we're not just sort of introducing two new semi-pro teams that are just gonna get beat up on by all of the current LCS teams. So we wanna make sure that any team that's gonna come in will be competitive. Um, and we also wanna make sure that the economics are right such that we're not just sort of diluting even further the revenues across the league. Um, I would say that we're probably, you know, at, at least a year out from, from seriously considering expansion efforts in North America. Um, and that's a conversation that, uh, you know, will involve team ownership because obviously that's such a direct impact on their bottom line. So, you know, w fortunately in the conversations that we've had, we've been very aligned around the desire to get to a bigger league and the interesting opportunities that affords, whether it be, you know, divisions or whether it be sort of uh, more interesting brand matchups or, you know, kind of a lot of, uh, a lot of great additive benefits there. Um, but we want to make sure that kind of the ecosystem is in the right place for it. And I think everyone is on board with agreeing that, that in 2018, we're just not quite ready. Chris, I'm so happy to hear that because, <laughs> because I, I, while I'd like to see expansion, I, I think you hit what a lot of fans are concerned about, which is, we just have the franchise league. There's the security. We have academy teams, and those academy teams are like able to finally develop talent. We really can see the depth of talent in the NALCS, but we we need some time. <laughs> we need some yep. time to look at it and really get the idea of how deep is it. Like, is there is there a whole other team? Are there twenty other players? Yeah, you know. And, yeah, and I think if if we saw an academy team that looked like cloud nine challenger did back when they came out of like the challenger league you know in 2013 things would look different mm. um but you know right now i think there's there's a lot of great player development going on there there's not anyone that's you know blowing every other team out of the water so i think from a competitive standpoint we like where academy is right now and we like where lcs is right now so there doesn't feel like a compelling need i mean we we, we like academy too but because we're biased towards our uh, our friend uh, oh, that's, Gabe, that's Gabe right Invert, the, 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 the coach of the current the first the defending the reigning <laughs> undefeated champions um Mark. is uh is a former uh former employee here at the score esports former co-host of this very podcast he, well actually we you know we we used to uh back in the day separate the podcast yes. i would do the general esports one we talk about csgo whatever and then he would do a league of legends focus one because his knowledge was so specialized and uh boy is it ever because he yeah, evidently he's, he's doing pretty yeah, good i was gonna say it's paying off mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and that's all down of course to the sport score esports podcast no. <laughs> the work he, did here. he was he was a really good coach before he started working for us oh so, uh, that that was his uh, primary don't, skill yeah don't, don't get away with that take the plug that's no, all no, you no, guys no. We're, we're here. i know i know right like i'm trying to i'm trying to sell this thing you know yeah. and these guys are bringing me back <laughs> no, down I'm, I, that's josh that's all josh i'm the one who brought it up to give our shout outs to gabe uh and our congratulations to him the i want now though ask about similarly there's a similar question about you brought it up before geolocation uh yep. and i'm gonna imagine like you said just said it's, it's probably not in the cards at the moment but what have the conversation if there have been conversations what have they looked like and what do you kind of personally think about geolocation within esports uh geolocation is a really interesting space um you know like i grew up a a huge sports fan right and i grew up a, a fan of duke university because my parents went there and i grew up a fan of all philadelphia sports teams because that's the town that i lived in and those are through studies galore the two primary ways that you pick up fandom in traditional sports um esports has been different esports didn't have a geographic you know kind of affinity so you could be a fan of TSM or Cloud9, whether you lived in Phoenix or Albany or Orlando. And my concern with geolocating in, an, in a league where there have been existing brands is that you almost disenfranchise the fans from outside of that market. So if you, you know, you put TSM into Phoenix, what about that TSM fan that lives in Albany who now believes that they have to be, you know, an Albany Team Liquid fan? Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I, I use geographies uh, hyperbically to yes, sure, sure, sure. point, not that we're considering before there's a Reddit thread that says, you know, Riot Esports considering Albany. <laughs> uh, you know, but I, 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 I am to a degree concerned about kind of disenfranchising those fans and the story that it tells when we say, like, to be a fan of this team, you should be from this market. I think that's a very kind of narrow bridge to walk. Not saying it can't be done, uh, but just saying that we have to be careful with a lot of those fan relationships and how we kind of port them over. Um, secondarily, I think there's a lot of nuance to how you do geolocation, right? There's a lot of, I mean, you look at the Overwatch League right now, 
and every match that they've played has been in LA and to my knowledge will be through probably the rest of the year which means you have teams that have geographic affiliations but not necessarily physical footprints mm -hmm. and from a logistical standpoint that's kind of the best of both worlds because you don't have to pay for travel for teams to play in all these different locations but you can start to sort of test the water of fan affinity in those regions you can start to see what fandom can develop just from affiliation with a with an esports brand um you know where they go from here in terms of the sort of the roadshow model and how they're going to do sort of you know transcontinental play uh remains to be seen um you know having done roadshows and having done you know in some cases sort of multi-regional tours with uh you know the the former iwc wildcard uh playoffs leading directly into worlds and things like that I've seen a lot of the difficulties of, of intercontinental and, and multi-country uh, events and logistics. I'm not super enthused to take that on on a regular season basis, um, but I think there's probably some, uh, you know, some nuanced methods and some nuanced uh, ways that we can kind of find a, a middle ground. I don't want to kind of commit too heavily here, but mm. uh, you know, we're speaking with teams about where their interest is and you know what opportunities we have to kind of associate. With those with those local fan bases because we do see a ton of advantage right you know it gives you a great market that you can kind of uh singularly target it gives you a great opportunity to speak to those fans it gives you a great opportunity to target local sponsorships because they know that they're being reflected back to that local market um and so we we want to find ways to capitalize on that we just want to make sure that in doing so we're not sort of jeopardizing the the you know kind of accessibility and consistency of the league and, and you know we don't want to kind of overburden players with travel and overburden the league with costs of travel and logistics and everything like that so there's still a lot to be solved on our side it is definitely the topic of discussion uh, but again not something that we're looking to put in place um in 2018 there there might be elements of a system that we we can test out in 2019 but uh i'll save that for the the next time i come on and we can talk about it then awesome. looking forward to it <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited to hear that you guys are considering it. And one thing that I was thinking about as you were talking is, you know, Optic kind of already sort of has this through the Overwatch League. I mean, admittedly, they have a different brand, but every, you know, it, it, there's not that huge separation between the two. So yep. it, it's really cool to hear. And as somebody who works in Toronto, mm. has lived in Southern Ontario my entire life, I just want to say I am a Montreal Canadiens fan despite all that. So, uh, it's messed up, dude. It's messed up. I don't like that. This happens every I'm, time we talk about jail. I'm just saying, too. if the yes. Albany, if the Albany, uh, Team Liquid became a reality, <laughs> you know, I don't live in Albany, so I'm actually probably more likely to uh, pull for Team Liquid. And, and then if you mean because they're closer, <laughs> well, yeah, that's yeah. true. We don't have any Canadian representation in the Overwatch League. Well, anyways, yeah, well, we had so... Team Canada in, la in the last uh, LCS yes. broadcast. We did have Team Canada. We have Hootie oh, now. Yeah, Hootie, we have Hootie. Hootie. That's right. The, that's the victorious Team Canada. Absolutely. Yes, yes. I honestly couldn't think of anybody I'd want to represent our country more than Hooney, which is kind of scary. That's insane. That's a, I was like actually, an intense per, I mean, you just made. And this might be too serious a question, but I was sort of frustrated that I, I always thought the NALCS Pigeon was Canadian, given, you know, he was from Vancouver. I mean, that was the debate at the end of the show, yeah. uh, was was whether he was American or whether he was sort of a Canadian, uh, a Canadian r resistance fighter all on his own. <laughs> Turned out that the, the the LCS pigeon is just about freedom, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's just about uh, the right to play League of Legends however he wants to play. He, I can't he, argue with freedom. He flew up from Seattle for sure. For I can't sure. argue with freedom. <laughs> I, maybe maybe he's one of those people who just doesn't want to pay taxes or be involved in any national government structure at all. You know? Yeah. All right, Josh. He's just going... like a ta yeah. He, he's a, a tax haven pigeon. <laughs> wow! Wow! This is political as hell right now. Oh, I love it. Um. Man, I had I had a real thing to ask, and then, we, then I started thinking about the pigeon. Um, that, I was guess, a, that was a real question. Please, I guess, I guess that was real journalism. I guess you're right. I guess you're right. Maybe I'm a little personally disappointed that we didn't get Ole on the Canadian the old <laughs> Canadian team. Yes, I, I'm continuing the streak of bringing up Ole every single podcast that we talk about League of Legends, <laughs> and most that we don't. Pardon? And some that we don't. And some that we don't. Um, just to confirm, Chris, to, to go back, would it be fair to say that? Riot is sort of considering something around geolocation that could possibly work in the future, maybe. Uh, I mean, when you put it that specifically, 
Uh, <laughs> uh, sure, for whatever value that sound bite has. I mean, I think I think what what I what I will say is we are very interested in further exploring both the the merits and challenges of a geolocation model. Our teams are similarly excited, and if we can come to a model that you know feels fiscally responsible and and value additive for our players, we'll go down that road. All right. I definitely appreciate that. Um, oh. I, the reason I couched it so heavily is we have a lot of guests who wouldn't say that. They would just try and dodge it. So I got to make it as soft as I can you, make it. But. Yeah. I, I mean, look, like if, if it's the right decision to make, we're going to make that decision. Like yeah. the, 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 are we looking at it? Are we not like that? I, I don't know. I, I don't see much value in not communicating to our fans what our, what our thinking is around some of these bigger elements. Like our fans have a right to know what we're building this league into and not just at the moment where we announce geolocation or we don't, you know, like yeah. to me, this is, this is the core part of, of being a fan of a league is you care more than just the results of the games on game day. You care about the direction that it's going, you know, NBA fans that, that complain about hand check rules every year. Like that's a big part of fandom, you know, like understanding where your league is going is, is a key piece to me. And so that's, partly why I am, I am committing to, you know, kind of trying to raise transparency mm. on our thinking around elements like this to the degree that I can. And, you know, there's going to be limits to what I can and can't say, but, you know, for this one where it's, it's something that we're certainly willing to explore, but, you know, we have no idea where it's going to come out. There's no harm in saying that we're exploring it. Colin, I, uh, I don't know what your gamer tag is nowadays, but I think you should change it to topiary. Cause damn, did you hedge on that one? Woo! Wow. You're just waiting. You're just waiting to use that. <laughs> I was sitting here the entire time being like, I need a hedge synonym. <laughs> well, Josh, in League of Legends, I am Dunstan checks in, so you can. That's uh, your. That uh, is your handle on League of Legends. Yeah, and on Steam too. You know what? Pretty much money. major every major esport. I am Dunstan checks in. You, you know it costs wow. money. That's an old shout out, by the way. <laughs> yes, he knows it. Yes. Oh, dude, I love that movie. Jason Alexander is in that movie I, as the dad. That was not a high, uh, not a high point in his career. I, I think, uh, that was but. a great point, and also, Chris, I want to tell you that I have explored the life of the orangutan who played Dunstan, <laughs> and really? he he had quite a life. Uh, it was it ended actually a little sadly. Uh, he was reunited with his son from a number of years ago after being taken for medical experiments. I swear to God, this is true. I swear this isn't the plot of another movie. And he angrily attacked his own son, and they had to be separated. And he later died. <laughs> I swear to God, that's what happened to the orangutan and Dunstan checks in. That's that, compared with like how lighthearted and funny that movie is. That's a serious downer you just added. That is a gritty. That's the gritty ending. His name, the gritty reboot. Yeah. His name, by the way, was Sam. Sam the orangutan. Sam the orangutan. That's real. I, uh, <laughs> I was supposed to throw to Dan. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, to, I, I, I motioned Dan like, let me just say the. Let me just say the topiary thing. I'm going to throw – and then it just went off. Sorry. sorry. Uh, I wanted to <laughs> jump off what you said about, about opening communication. Uh, and what I wanted to ask about is something that, honestly, I don't know that we've heard a lot about. Personally, I've asked a bunch of players about this. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to know more about the the Players Association because it's, it's sort of been about eight months since we last heard anything from kind of major yep. about it. And, and I want to know, maybe at, at the basis level, how does the Players Association work right now? Um, I mean, it, it sort of works in the same capacity that it was originally built to be. It's, you know, it's Hal and the, the team that he is in the process of building out. Um, and they work with players on a variety of issues. Um, there, you know, uh, there's different topics that they kind of discuss. There's different elements that they bring to the league around, you know, input that they'll have on competitive decisions. You know, we've, we, we raise visibility with the player association on, some of the bigger changes that we're considering to kind of gather feedback just as we do with some of the owners. So, you know, right now it's, it's really how building out the team uh, and trying to work with the players on what their greatest uh, pain points are. Um, so in that sense, it, it sort of is what it was built to be. I think in terms of building out the team, that's sort of the primary focus is trying to get to the point where they have all of the resources kind of in house that are able to take care of the various pain points. And it's, you know, it's not just Hal who's going to be able to solve every problem. You know, they need, you know, advice from uh, tax accountants and lawyers and, uh, you know, agents and kind of all different things. And there's a lot of time taken to kind of vet those resources for credibility 
and understand kind of where the uh, where the, where the right folks are to kind of handle some of these topics. So I think that's been the the primary focus this year um, is just sort of building out this suite of resources that the players can leverage. If it, I, and this is sort of a pointy question, but kind of what has what what are those pain points for the players? What were they? What has the player association accomplished for them so far? Um, I you know it's. It's hard to say that it's something specific that you'll point to and say the Players Association accomplished this because in and of itself, the Players Association doesn't have a lot of very explicit rights to enact change. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is done in collaboration with Riot or in collaboration with teams. So like things that we're talking about right now are you know certain contractual provisions uh, that we believe should either be standardized or certain contractual provisions that we believe should be ruled out in contracts across the league. And so that's a, a multi-party decision that has to, you know, take into account the the ways that players want to be treated and and you know le have have certain legal rights. It has to take into account what the teams want in terms of the legal rights and protections that they want to have. Um, and it has to take into account some of the elements of how Riot needs to be able to interact with both those parties on a legal basis. So you know, it's hard to point to something and be like, this is what the players' association did because in large part it's things that they do with us or with teams and kind of operate in conjunction. Fair enough, fair enough. I guess the other thing um, about the Players Associ Association is that it does require, I would imagine, a certain amount of buy-in from the players themselves, um, and a lot of them are very, very young being esports. I remember we brought this topic up with, I think it was X Smithy when we spoke to him um, about, you know, do you see the very young guys, the new guys, sort of being conscious of the fact that that they have an organization that's supposed to have their backs as a player that isn't part of the the org that they that they ink the contract with you know do they do they think about uh oh gee what am i going to do after league of legends oh should i should i save some money what, what should i do well, how do taxes work no. you know things like that yeah i mean fortunately on on that regard i think you know as we've been knowing that the players association was going to take some time to get set up riot has historically invested in both conferences for new players as well as conferences for all players the new players is kind of like the nba rookie symposium where we do everything from basic financial literacy and training to some really brief media training highlights on contracts and sort of things that can you get you caught up we actually do those with the scouting grounds players as well um, as sort of guys who are going to be coming into the league pretty soon so historically riot's taken on a lot of that that training and, and education element we certainly anticipate that the, the player association will take it on in the near future. Um, to your original point, though, about the player participation, I think it's it's something where certain players see value in it and certain players don't see a ton of value in it. I think right now, given the way that salaries have exploded so significantly, there's a lot of players that kind of look around and say, like, I'm living a pretty good life. Like, I don't, there's not a ton that I need. You know, I'm making way more money than I ever anticipated that I could. So, I don't have much that I need to kind of like try and get out of the team that I'm playing for. And so I think that that explosion in salary and that explosion in sort of growth in the general kind of like player welfare has limited to an extent some of the urgency of participating in the player association because, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of the players, like life is pretty good. Their gamer houses are pretty nice and their contracts are, are pretty stable and they're, they're very well paid. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I think what it's probably going to take is someone who really, you know, perhaps it's an ex player, perhaps it's an ex coach, um, but someone's going to have to come down the line that has a lot of legitimacy in the space and really wants to think about solidifying the long term future for players. Um, you know, player lives right now are great. We, had, we, we certainly hope and we've built a model that we hope creates great lives for our players going forward. Uh, you know, but the league might someday in the future face some difficult financial decisions. And that's where a player association and, a, and potentially a player's union down the road is built to create some protections for players in that time. And we need someone who's thinking about that. We need someone who's thinking about the future and thinking about the kind of legacy that they can leave for the players. And so whether that's a player in the league right now or you know someone who you know might retire in the years to come, I would anticipate that that's gonna kind of be the galvanizing force that really kicks off the player association and whether they unionize or not, really kind of gets that going into the the future thinking, uh, you know, really kind of strong player representative, strong communicative body that we anticipate it being. 
Gotcha, gotcha. What we need is a League of Legends Jimmy Hoffa, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little, that's a bit intense. We're gonna find... Hopefully, if whoever it is doesn't end up being buried in yeah, concrete I was gonna say, or gonna whatever. Find, like, New Jersey. Are we going to find like Scara just in a, like a football field Whoa. somewhere? I was thinking high. High? I, mean, <laughs> I had him in my head like for a... some reason. All right. Um, as we begin to uh, wind down here, Chris, I just wanted to uh, ask you a question about how mindful or not uh, Riot is in NA about broadcast competition from the Overwatch League. Obviously, two very different esports. However, uh, Overwatch uh, came into being in terms of the OWL, the franchise semi geolocated league, at the same time that NA franchised. And they also uh, broadcast in a similar league structure. That is a studio where there's very um, structured, scheduled games that happen every night at this time. You can tune in to see your favorite team. And they also overlap certain days. I think it's one day with EU and one day with NA. So there is some actual head-to-head -head competition there as well. But is, is that um, top of mind at all at, at Riot? Um, you mean the direct overlap and sort of the the head to head competition there? I su I suppose so because during a weekday, obviously there is no direct competition. Um, I I would say not not so much. We haven't noticed a significant downturn uh, aside from probably the very first week that Overwatch League was on when I think everyone was sort of tuning in to see the spectacle. Um, I think since then our core audience has has come back, and I think where we have overlap. We haven't necessarily noticed a strong downturn. Um, there's there's a ton of differences between Overwatch and League of Legends in terms of player based preferences and uh, you know what the league itself is representing and kind of like the different tax of the of the two uh, organizations. And so I think from that standpoint, you know it's it's another product that's kind of out in the market. We're certainly keeping an eye on them to to understand how they're doing, but. You know, I, I think we're we're fundamentally trying to tell a different story and speak to a different audience. You know, we're yeah. we're speaking solely to an NA audience primarily um, and trying to build out the best league that we can for North America, as are the other 14 leagues that we have. Uh, whereas Overwatch League is their it's their only product, so they're trying to speak to the global audience. And so, in that sense, you know, we're trying to tell I think a more uh, kind of concentrated message and, and address a more concentrated slice of the fandom i think you know blizzard by uh extension of the model that they have has to cast a very wide net and has to try and target a very wide audience that prevents them from going deeper in certain areas uh that we can i think if you look at for example the amount of content that we put out on a weekly basis in some of all of our leagues highlighting players and highlighting pros and you know putting the spotlight on on teams as, as they're competing in their run for playoffs you know, it's exponentially more than one global league is able to put out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's just such a different model that for us, it's not really something that we're we're looking to compare ourselves to. You know, our our ACU and and a lot of our viewership stats have been very strong this season, and we're very happy with how this season has gone from a viewership perspective, especially given the number of factors we changed going into the start of the season. Whether that be you know four brand new teams different start time to our broadcast, different Twitch location that we we're broadcasting on, going from BO3 to BO1. You know, we, we threw as many curveballs at our audience as we could. And so to see them kind of stick through it um, and actually build in viewership and building kind of uh, energy and excitement as the playoffs went on, uh, you know, that's that to us is sort of the the metrics that we look at. We're not we're not comparing ourselves with with Overwatch League. That's fair. That's fair. And even as I ask the question, I do have in, in the front of my mind that it does seem that most fans are League of Legends fans, Overwatch fans, or CSGO fans. Sorry, I forgot the first or there. Mm -hmm. The point being... Whoa, no Dota fans. What up? Why? They're Dota <laughs> fans too, okay? <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for us to forget that because here in this office, we really love esports. Um, we are yeah. literally paid to know about them. Yes. Um, and we do love them outside of that time we are paid too. So we all like to tune into as much as we can. And we find ourselves going, oh, did you watch this? Oh, no, I had to watch this. I watched that. Yeah, a but oh, that is not the reality, I think, for a lot of the fans on the ground. Yeah, You know, they're just League yeah, of Legends fans. Yeah, I mean, we, we saw this with the BO3 to BO1 decision. You know, just in the BO3 model, we were already putting out so much content that it was impossible for the overwhelming majority of our viewers to feel like they could keep up with the league. Mm -hmm. You know, it was hard enough for them to watch their best team play in a given weekend 
much less watch multiple teams playing a given weekend to kind of get a sense of how the NALCS was to was progressing as a whole. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, you can spend three hours on Saturday and three hours on Sunday, you know, about the same amount of time it would have taken you to just watch your team a year ago. And you can watch the top six matches from that week and you can watch almost all of the competitive teams in play. So I think, you know, when it comes to just the amount of content that these leagues are starting to put out, it does make it really difficult to stay abreast of more than one game. And especially, uh, you know, when you're when you're comparing different esport titles like Overwatch and CSGO and League, it's even more difficult there because then you're keeping up with patch notes and you're keeping up with the difference, you know, the different maps that, that are released. And there's so many changes there as opposed to just being a fan of NA and potentially EU LCS. That's a much narrower bridge to gap. Um, or sorry, narrow gap to bridge. <laughs> um, so I think you know a lot of our a lot of our fans tend to be fans of multiple League of Legends leagues, yes. um, less so fans of multiple esport leagues. Yeah, that's totally fair. Uh, I agree. And uh, as someone who watches a lot of all the aforementioned esports, God bless Best of Ones. That's, that's <laughs> yes. all I have to say. I do really enjoy watching Best of Ones on the weekend. But but yeah, so we've been we've been thrilled with the 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 response from fans. We, I, I mean, just I know this is this is all like circumstantial, but I, I've had a ton of people that I personally know who used to watch it come back to it just because yeah. of best of ones. And even like I, I hate to say this as somebody who's really playing for Rock Hat in EU this year. Okay, but uh, like you know the old Rock Hat Giant special on EU best of three. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm just not gonna. I didn't sit through it last year. I'm gonna be honest. So I think best of ones are just like you, you, you actually, I think as franchises that maybe are a little bit less popular with fans, I think best of one is a huge blessing for them, especially. Yep. I, I think, you know, I, I, I'll watch optic gaming play golden guardians because it's the best yep. of one and it's not going to be, you know, maybe three really long games. So. Yeah, it's a 40 minute game. What do you got to lose? Right. You're yeah. going to see some cool shit. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, I guess uh, we're, we're getting to the end of our time here. Uh, so, Chris, I just want to, before we do say goodbye, leave the floor open to you and, and see if you wanted to say something you didn't get a chance to, bring up a topic that we never did, or simply just uh, give a shout-out to all the NA fans out there. Uh, I, I will definitely take the opportunity to give a shout-out to the NA fans out there. Um, you know, uh, we've been doing esports for six years now, and the – passion and dedication of our fans has amazed us uh, every day since we started and, and continues to. Uh, we're incredibly excited for the show that we have coming up this weekend in Miami. We hope that everyone tunes in uh, for both the third place match and the championship match. Uh, we're incredibly excited to crown a new champion uh, in the league, whether it be 100 Thieves or Team Liquid. Uh, and so, you know, kind of uh, best of luck to both of the competitors. And uh, for those of you interested in watching that that international competition we have msi right around the corner uh which having seen uh some of the the content that we have coming up for that should be uh just as compelling of a show so lots of great stuff coming for this year in league of legends uh we're incredibly excited about our future and uh incredibly thankful that, that all the fans stick with us through this long ride Awesome. Well, we are all looking forward to uh, both those competitions here at the Score Esports. And Chris, we want to thank you so much for your time. We really, hey, really my do pleasure. appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. This was great. Thank all you right. so much. Well, until next time, and I do hope there will be a next time, take care. Thanks, guys. All right, bye. Have a good one. Well, right. that was very enjoyable. Yeah, that was. Um, I think it was a really We covered a, talk. a lot of stuff there. A mm -hmm. lot of different stuff. And it got me hyped for finals. Yeah. Which I'm sure, I'm sure Chris is happy about. Yeah, I mean, I... I <laughs> It's gonna be an interesting uh, finals. I definitely think. Like it'll, it's a, it'll be. Man. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. It's gonna. What, be whatever happens, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be really interesting. Absolutely. And and even I think the third place match is gonna be pretty cool to watch. Yeah. I. You know. It's it's not like a situation where like uh, we had in uh, CS:GO a little a little while ago where it kind of feels like what why the fuck are you putting these teams through this? You yeah. Know? Like let's just cut the shit. But I, I'm legitimately looking forward to that match as yeah, well. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and and again, I think that some of the talk about the the broadcasting stuff and the future of the NALCS was was really fascinating and, and illuminating. Yeah. And, and I'm for really the, curious about how the EU will go. Yeah. No. Seriously. Sorry for cutting you off. For the suit. No. Not at all. And for the super immediate broadcast future, as in like days from now. Yeah. Now I'm gonna be watching this venue a little bit. You know, after absolutely. Chris is saying we're gonna do some different stuff with it, now I'm gonna be like, okay, what kind of stuff are you gonna do? Right. Mm -hmm. Let me show me. Show yeah, me. Absolutely. Show me the access yeah yeah josh you're real quiet over there i will 
I was actually going to say, I'm doing board things. That's doing, what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, right? you can't see it, but there's a there's a big soundboard underneath the jo- of, Josh's face right now. Yeah, a lot of shiny lot, buttons. A lot of sliders that go I was going to say that the, the intimate talk reminded me a lot of sort of the, the talk around uh, FGC venues. It happens a lot where people yes. kind of compare. It's like you get to sort of be shoulder to shoulder with the players. And obviously that's not quite what's going to happen Probably here. Probably not. But I, I do like the idea of making players more accessible to fans. It, it often feels, especially, you know, you've seen CSGO and people are in booths or in League of Legends and people are on a stage far away from you you don't really have the chance to sort of experience an event the way they experience an event not at this level like definitely no. some smaller um csgo events like we had we had the minor for the last major the <laughs> na minor rather here in toronto um sorry to switch from league of legends to csgo no, it's, it's, a, it's an example you can give though. yeah league and, does not have those kinds of tournaments it was often. a really tight venue it was really just for broadcast it wasn't so much a live venue and like the teams that weren't in the finals like they were in the stands next to you Yep. You know, they were get they were they were watching, laughing, talking about it. And yep. You were just like, oh yeah, what's up? And, and it would be cool if that's the kind of thing that I think. And, and it does sound like that's something similar to what we're going for, to what Riot's going for in, in Miami, with just something a little bit more intimate, a little bit more fan interactive. And I'm excited to see what that looks like, especially for the uh, audience at home. Time will tell. Time. I like will the tell. I like the FGC comparison because that was the thing that always jumped out at me. Like even when I was. I don't even know if esports was the right word. I was pre esports. Yeah. But yeah. In, into fighting games and being able to go to a tournament and be like, that is Justin Long and he is like three feet from me. And, yep. uh, and, and you could know, even talk to him if you, you, so, to if him. you so choose. If you're and, so inclined. And you could be sure like, what do you think about Skullgirls? You know, when that he's game came out. He's a fan. Yeah. yeah. He's a fan. He's got the fundamentals, man. What have, Skullgirls is a great game. I, um,. <laughs> I'm just here to stand for Skullgirls. Hello, hi. I love Skullgirls. We all have it's the our best fighting game of all man. time. We have all well, I'm candles. I'm really glad that really I think Chris got the full the score esports press and he got Ole. He yeah. got Johnston uh, checks. He got Dunstan in. checks yes. in. He got he got really everything the score esports office has to offer. Yo, all you guys out there who play he was CSGO, missing- if you are on NA servers and you are silver and you see Dunstan checks in, you better get ready to be wrecked. You better get ready to get that thirty bomb dropped on you. I was going to say that really all he was missing was Colin rapping uh, to Let's, really get the full of Corey Sports experience, but maybe we'll give that to him next time. Maybe we will. Let's cut this off before I do start rapping. That, not even I want to hear that. Please. All right. This has been the Scory Sports Podcast. Once again, thank you so much to our guest, Chris Hopper, and thank you to you for listening. We do this every week, so don't forget to tune in for Josh Burry, for Daniel Rosen. I'm Colin McNeil saying until next time, GG.